Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a t-test for two independent samples um, at chapter 10 in the Gravner and Walno textbook. And I'm going to um, give you the full demo. The one that I'm going to use, and I will, I will modify it on some level. The question I'm going to do is question six. Two separate samples receive different treatments. After treatment, the first sample has an N of six or N of nine with a sum of squares of 462. And the second has an N of seven with a sum of squares of 420. Rather than go through A, B, and C separately, I'm going to combine them together into a full four-step hypothesis testing procedure. The first thing is to pull out the information that we need and start to identify what type of a question is this. We've got two separate samples. These are independent of each other. They receive different treatments. So we have two samples, which means it's not a single sample t-test. And they are independent separate groups which means that it is a t-test for independent samples rather than a repeated measures t-test. So after treatment, the first sample has an N of nine. So that's N1. So we wanna use the subscripts to keep um, the groups, the means and their associated sum of squares together. And the sum of squares of group one is 462. The separate sample, the second has an N, so N2 is seven, with the sum of squares of 420. We will compute the pooled variance and calculate the estimated standard error for the sample mean difference within the hypothesis testing procedure. If the sample mean difference is 10 points, that's kind of the tricky wording on this question. So it talks about a sample mean difference. Rather than giving you the mean of sample one and the mean of sample two, it is straight up told you the difference between M1 and M2, so is 10. So M1 subtract M2 is equal to 10. So the way the information is presented is a little bit different. We have a two-tailed test with an alpha of 0.05. The way that this information is presented stating the sample mean difference means that it either had to tell you that it's a two-tailed test, in which case it doesn't matter if you subtract group one from group two or group two from group one, because either direction is okay with a two-tailed test, which is what it did. Or it would need to say whether or not the difference is in the direction that was expected if it wasn't a one-tailed test, but it's not, so we're good. So the first piece, so I've got my mean, my N of group one, sorry, I'm trying to adjust my cameras here. The N of group one, the sum of squares of group one. The N of group two, the sum of squares of group two, I've got my sample mean difference and this information. Step one, state the hypotheses. In this case, we have a two-tailed test. We know we do because the question told us. We have the mean of group one and the mean of group two. That's what we're comparing. In the null, they're equal. So group one equals group two. The alternate 
is a barony form. And for a two-tailed test, this is what our hypotheses are. We can, and this will be useful for us later, we can also look at this null hypothesis a bit differently. Um, if we take, if we subtract mu2 from each side, then what we have is mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. Is these two cancel out? A number minus itself, whatever that number is, is zero. So this is also useful when we look at the t-test in step three. So keep that in mind. Step two. Find your critical values. To find your critical values, you need your degrees of freedom. You need the alpha and you need two-tailed. Our degrees of freedom for an independent samples t-test is n1 plus n2 subtract 2. In essence, what this is is degrees of freedom 1 plus degrees of freedom 2. Because the degrees of freedom of group one is n1 minus 1. And the degrees of freedom of group two is n2 minus 1. And so then if we combine that, we get to this version. But seeing those relationships can be helpful. So in essence, the degrees of freedom of the independent samples t-test is the degrees of freedom of group one plus the degrees of freedom of group two. Nine plus seven subtract two is fourteen. What we'll then do is we will go. I will share my screen. We will go to the statistical tables. We will go down to table B two. That's the t distribution table. We have a two-tailed test with an alpha of 0.05. So we're going to look in this column, and then we're going to go down to the degrees of freedom. So our degrees of freedom here is 14. So the value, the critical values are plus or minus. T critical, let me find a spot to put this, T critical. plus or minus 2.145. The plus or minus is important. The plus or minus is because we have a two-tailed test. So what we're saying is that a difference in either direction Will be statistically, will be you know potentially statistically significant. So we've got negative two point one four five, positive two point one four five. Anything in here fail to reject the null. Anything out here or out here, we're going to reject the null and accept the alternate. So what we now need to do. We've got step two done. We need to go to step three. With step three, an important piece is that our sample sizes are different. That means that before we can calculate the estimated standard error, we need to calculate the pooled variance, which, if you go back, that it was question 6a was. Find the pool variance. Question 6b was find the estimated standard error. And then C was this full, you know, hypothesis test. So we're embedding now A and B into here. For the pool variance, 
We need the pooled variance for sure. There's no alternate way to get the estimated standard error because our sample sizes are different. Can bypass this step if your sample sizes are different. We have sum of squares. So the variance that I, or the formula that I'm going to use is sum of squares one plus sum of squares two divided by degrees of freedom one plus degrees of freedom two. The degrees of freedom of group one is n one minus one and nine minus one is eight. And the degrees of freedom of group two is n two minus one, which is seven minus one, which is six. We're gonna take the sum of squares of group one or 62 plus the sum of squares of group two or 20 divided by eight plus six. Four sixty two plus four twenty eight eighty two divided by fourteen, which is sixty three. The less confident you are about the process, the more concerned you are that you're going to make a mistake the more steps you should show. If you jump from here to here without showing me this in-between piece and you make a mistake, I don't know what mistake you did. Did you put the wrong numbers? Did you press the wrong button in your calculator? Instead, you show me this step and you get a different answer. I have a little bit more understanding what you did, possibly. And if you show me each step, then I can follow along. And if you make a mistake on an exam, I am better able to give you marks for what you show me you know. You show me more work, I have a better understanding of what you know. I'm going to need that number later. So I'm going to put that full variance over here so that I can erase that. Sorry about that, and I'm just not going to restart because I'm too far in. I live by alarms. They tell me where to go and when. And that's how I manage a lot of my life. So I've calculated the pool variance. Now I'm going to calculate the estimated standard error. And then I will use that estimated standard error in my t-test. First, I need the estimated standard error, which was 6b. Some of y'all are going to start being freaked out by the number of subscripts. Subscripts are necessary because they help us differentiate and identify what goes with what. So it looks complicated, but it's more of a labeling process. It's not that you know, N1 is not a new variable. We have it labeled so that we know that's the N for that group. It's, like I said, a labeling process. So the formula we need here is, we're gonna use the pool variance instead of the variance for each group. And we do that because we have different sample sizes. If we have the same sample size, we could also do the pooled variance and then calculate the estimated standard error. When we have equal sample sizes, we have choices. When we have unequal sample size, this is how it needs to be done. Otherwise, we get the wrong answer. We have 63, because that's what we just calculated divided by nine, and not degrees of freedom here, and use your sample sizes, 63 divided by seven. So 63 divided by nine is seven. 
So then 63 divided by seven is going to be nine. That's the square root of 16, which is four. So our estimated standard error is four. We can use four and put that into our T. Our T formula is M1 minus M2 subtract mu1 minus mu2 divided by the estimated standard error. Looks freaky. Don't freak out. This is zero. Because of our null hypothesis, remember I mentioned this. Scroll back to it if you forgot. Remember, I said that the null was mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. Okay. The hypothesis test is always about the null hypothesis. We hope that the alternate is true. We hope that we reject the null, oftentimes. We hope that we reject the null and accept the alternate. Very few situations where we hope otherwise. But we always test the null. Our decision is always reject the null or fail to reject the null. That's, that's where it's at. We're not far with zero. Now remember, that this question was worded a bit differently. It said the sample mean difference was 10. Didn't give us M1 and M2, it gave us the difference. So we already have the top calculator, it's 10. And then the estimated standard error is four. And so then 10 divided by four is 2.5. That's the number we are going to compare to our t-critical when we do step four of the hypothesis testing procedure. So let's write that somewhere. T calculated. You'll also may hear T obtained. The T calculated was 2.5. Step four. You need to make a decision. You need to interpret that decision. You need to provide evidence. Because frankly, you either reject or fail to reject the null. You got a 50 50 shot, right? So I need to see on an exam that you're not guessing. So go back to that diagram because this diagram can be your evidence depending on you know how you like to look at it. That was the critical values were negative 2.145 and positive 2.145. The value we calculated was 2.5. It's in that anything that's out here or out here, those areas that are just shaded in are critical regions. If the value falls in the critical region, we reject the null. So here, our value that we calculated uh, is more extreme than the cutoff value. So we are going to reject the null, accept the alternate. Got a 50 50 shot at that. This is your evidence. So, on an exam, I know that you are understanding what you're doing. So, I want you to interpret it because what does this mean? Right? It means that there is a significant difference between group one and group two. The, the difference between group one and group two is statistical.
statistically. Significant. If on an exam you have time to write all that out, great. If on an exam you don't have enough time to write it out, at least in my classes, statistically significant. If you reject the null, it is statistically significant. If you fail to reject the null, it is not statistically significant. I have you tell me both because otherwise students may, may get this correct, but not know what it means. And you need to be able to interpret the numbers and the decisions that you're making in order to really use the statistics that you're learning. So that's your full four-step hypothesis testing procedure. This is long enough. I'm not going to go into effect size measures for this demo. All right, so this helps. I hope you followed along. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to help. Um, send, send me an email uh, via Canvas and we'll go from there. Or schedule an office hour if you are um, an Alamo College student in one of my classes. I'm not gonna tutor or, or have um, you know, office hours if you have a different professor. That way lies you know, madness or getting things messy. <laughs>